All right, guys, let's try again. <laughs> you know, when I went back to delete the other show, which only really about eight minutes of it came through, basically, it would have already been flagged. Now, why would they flag a video in which you're talking about Jesus and his example? Probably because this is powerful information. So if you're just tuning in, we had our live show basically come under buffering attack and so here we are again we're going to start from the beginning about what the bible says about protests so we looked at the definition of what a protest is before we think about where there are protests in the bible and we came up with the definition of a protest being an organized crowd with a message that goes contrary to the establishment that makes their message, beliefs, and feelings publicly known. And we also can agree that this is usually in the face of possible retribution by the establishment, social ostracizing. Uh, you know, this could mean ticketing, could mean fines, could mean all kinds of things. Look at the protests of the past. Look at how the crowds who marched with Martin Luther King were treated. They were taken out with water cannons and things. Yet, everyone can agree now in history that they were right and they were correct. And that their mission of equality was a good thing. But look at how the establishment treated them. So, are protests wrong? No, they're not. Now, it all depends on who is leading the protest. If the protest is a trap, of course, you don't want to go to that protest. I think a great example is what happened with Truman and the Krapitol. That was a trap. So, it all depends on the cause, who's leading the cause, and the likelihood of infiltration that could derail the entire mission of the protest. Another element of protest is either violence or nonviolence, and obviously... Jesus' protests were nonviolent. So that would be something. If you saw something like that starting to kick off, you don't get involved in it because of the example that Jesus set for us. Is Are we correct here? Because I understand that some people just don't believe in protest, period. Well, we're going to get into what Jesus did. And you will see after today that what he did was very, very close to a peaceful protest. We're going to get into the Bible today. We're going to look very deep into this. Now, the definition that I just gave you of a protest, I think, is a really good definition. But the question is, was Jesus a protester? And I believe he was. And if we're going to do a protest, his would be the example to follow. Now, did Jesus' message go against the establishment? Yes, it did. He preached the gospel, which the establishment of his day did not believe. Right? So he preached against the establishment. But it wasn't just the gospel that he preached about. Jesus made his feelings known about paying tribute to Caesar. He made his feelings known about money in the temple. And he made his feelings known about the incorrect interpretation of biblical doctrine that the scribes and Pharisees were using to control the people. Jesus opposed the establishment. He opposed the secular establishment, the medical establishment, and the religious establishment. Now, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now, we're going to look at some of these verses today. But before we do, let's ask a couple questions. Were there crowds? Well, of course there were. Where Were they there with a public message? Yes, they were. Just by default, by following Jesus and his public message, they took on his opposition to the establishment views. That's why they were there. They were there in the face of danger. They knew that the local establishment was against Jesus. 
but yet they still followed him. They became part of the protest. They accepted Jesus' views. They came on faith to be healed, which the religious establishment said was blasphemous and demonic. They actually accused Jesus of being some kind of sage or something. Or a false prophet. That he was claiming to be God and really wasn't. And that whatever power he was using was not of God. This is all the things he was being accused of. Does all this sound familiar? Now God gave me a vision last night. Woke up in the middle of the night. This is usually how this happens. The vision was, Casey, the reason why they hate you, the reason why you got your strike was because you were talking about two different things in the same sentence. Faith and healing. And the two are diametrically opposed to one another. The secular definition of healing versus the faith-based definition of healing. And this is where you get into Antichrist practices. Because some of the things that they are claiming are against and in opposition to what Jesus taught. And so therefore, they label these things Miss I-N-F-O. Now, let's try to fully grasp the atmosphere in which Jesus was living in his day and exactly what he did while he was here on earth in today's standards. And to do this, we have to understand the governing body of the day which was the Sanhedrin. They were the local governing body of Jesus' day. I'm going to show you that here in this Wikipedia article, now that we're not having streaming problems. The local governing body of the day, right around the time Jesus was on this earth, was the Sanhedrin. And they handled everything, religious and political, legislative, and judicial. As it says right here. Now, they were given this power by Rome. Rome didn't really want to deal with the local authorities unless it had to do with this. This is maybe what got our video flagged too. Uh, they were not concerned with religious affairs unless that word was ex was suspected. Okay? So, there you have it. Now you understand what things were like back then. So let's do a modern day metaphor of what Jesus' life was like back then. The atmosphere of what he was up against. So in today's standards, imagine that the Catholic Church is given mayorship over all of the cities. They handle the cops. They handle um, ticketing, fines. Um, collecting of taxes, all of that. All of that goes through the Catholic Church and their mayors of all of the major cities in America. That would be a metaphor for what was going on during Jesus' day. And the Catholic Church falls under the federal government, which would be like Rome, which would be our federal government. So, that's what he was up against. They were the local governing body. So, were Jesus' protests peaceful? Yes, they were. Much like the days of Martin Luther King and his protests. Now, there was one time where Jesus had a crapitole moment, wasn't it? When he went into the temple and turned over the money tables. This was tantamount to trying to disrupt the religious, political institution, right? They had a, an institution in place to have money in the temple, and Jesus went in and turned it over. Isn't it interesting how everything comes full circle? Now, I don't recommend doing that today, because we ain't no Jesus, right? But this is what happened in the day. And also, the quote-unquote leaders of today are not the leaders like Jesus was, right? 
The leader under which the Karapatol happened was a false prophet in a trap. Much different scenario. So, let's get into the gospel and read about what Jesus and the crowds did and see if it came across as a protest. First of all, let's get into the Bible here. What was Jesus convicted of? Well, a lot of people don't know this scripture. Most of us only remember the part about blasphemy, that he claimed to be God, remember? Why don't the churches lead with what he was really convicted of, or the other part of it? Here in Luke 23, 1-16. And let's do a page search because I forget which verse it is. Um, okay, so here it is. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him into Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Forbidding the paying of tribute, as some, um, some translations say. Now, what do you mean? Well, there's a precedent to this verse. When Jesus was with the disciple, they were going in. The disciple said, are we to pay tribute? And Jesus asked the disciple, does Caesar's children, do Caesar's children pay tribute? And the disciple said, no. And at that point, Jesus said, well, you're the son of me. So would I make you pay tribute? And the disciple said, no. He goes, well, go in the river right there and find a fish with a coin in its mouth. And we'll just give it to him so as not to offend him. But it was by no means an obligation. Now, notice how the churches focus on other parts of this. This whole tax thing. Jesus hated taxes. And this is what he was part of why he was convicted. He was forbidding the paying of tribute. So, like most Americans, Jesus hated taxes. We all hate taxes. Now, notice how churches steer away from this passage. Why do you think that is? Because they want you to focus on the misinterpreted Romans 13, which is all about submitting to satanic governments. Now, if you still believe in Romans 13 and you believe that it was interpreted correctly and that you're supposed to submit to satanic governments, how does that jive with 1 John 5.19? The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one, the evil one. It's under his power. These are the governments we're supposed to be like obeying and listening to. When they are asking us to do things against what the Bible says? This is the same wicked one that offered this power to Jesus when he tempted him, remember? Why would God then command us to have allegiance to these governments? When it opposes his will? He wouldn't. Our obedience to God should be enough law and order to suffice for any government because the spirit of the Ten Commandments, the spirit of the law would make you a great citizen, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that make you a great citizen? Everything else was not supported by Jesus or his disciples. It's just not in the Bible. And they were all martyred for disobeying their governments, weren't they? Every single disciple except for Judas he died for betrayal, but all of the rest of them, you can look it up yourself, they died at the hands of their governments for, and they were martyred because they didn't give in. So what is the verse about Jesus saying, give Caesar's things to Caesar and God's things to God? Well, that was a trick answer. 
What do you mean, Casey? Well, to the people who are obligated to Caesar and serve Caesar, and if that's your master, yes, you should pay. To the people who serve God, no, there's ways around it. The way around it is you don't make enough money to be taxed. There are other ways, too, that are quote-unquote legal. God always gives us a way out. There's a way to do it legally. But you have to almost, it's almost like you're following Jesus' example. You forsake everything else. You pick up your cross. And yeah, you're going to make peanuts the rest of your life. But you're going to be happy and free from the beast. So what that verse really meant was, what do you owe Caesar? If you feel like you owe him something, then he is your master. Because in Jesus' mind, you don't owe him anything. Because if Jesus wanted the rulership that Caesar commanded, he could have taken it. And if he, if Jesus didn't demand any tribute, then why should you be giving it to a man on earth? Now, what else did Jesus teach? Well, he taught repentance of sin and belief in him instead of the previous belief system or the established belief system. And all these ideas were anti-establishment at the time. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes wanted people to trust and believe in them, not Jesus. And that's why they crucified him. Because he opposed the establishment. He was gaining power and influencing people's ideas with the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. He was healing people, subverting their own doctors. He was a peaceful protester whose allegiance was to one person, his father in heaven, not the local authorities, not the Roman Empire. He was in and out of cities and temples, followed by large crowds. Sounds to me like a peaceful protest. Let's read about these crowds and where they went. Did a key word search. Here's one of my favorite sites I use, Bible Gateway. You can search these key words. And back then they called the crowd a multitude. So I, I searched multitude. And up come these 21 biblical passages in the New Testament. And we can look at what these crowds did and where they went. Here's a protest right here. And there were, followed him a great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So let me give you an example. Let's drill this down a bit and get a little bit more specific so that you guys can imagine this. So these multitudes were coming from all these cities. They were on the road. Obviously, they probably came in contact with people and said, where are you going? They say, we're going to follow Jesus, the leader of a protest. And they, no doubt some of these people got into debates with the people that encountered them. Maybe they were Roman soldiers. Well, why are you going to go to that guy? He's subverting the nation, telling people not to pay taxes. Well, we believe in Jesus. We believe in his message. That's a protest. You got to get creative with your thinking when you're when you're imagining these things. So here's all the times the word multitude in reference to Jesus and then following him with a message that was different than the establishment. And seeing the multitudes he went up into a mountain when he and and when he was set his disciples came unto him. When he was come down from the mountains, great multitudes followed him. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. They glorified God. The devil was cast out. And this is when he began to heal these people. So imagine all these people were coming to Jesus for healing instead of the establishment. Right? Right? Now, we don't have Jesus today with us, and there are different ideas about healing, different doctrines about what is possible 
And I, I probably need to research that and do a show on it. Because some doctrines believe there is no faith healing in the last days. And other doctrines believe that there is faith healing in the last days. And so that's something we need to break down in the Bible to see if it is something that is possible today. I believe it is, but I want to make sure that that's biblical. But what we do know is that it happened back in Jesus' day. And there were huge crowds. So let's keep going with this. And what were these crowds doing? We already covered that. Listening, they were being taught. They were hearing the gospel, the good news. They were being healed. They are in and out of these cities. Now, did Jesus actually bring his message and these crowds into actual places of religious government? Yes, he did. Let's search the word temple. So I got that pulled up here. And that comes up several times in the New Testament as well. Of course, there were synagogues and temples, right? And look at Matthew 21, 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Let's look at a little bit more of the context of this. And said unto him, Hearest thou what they these say? And Jesus said to them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? Then we look at Matthew 21, 23. And they were challenging Jesus' authority. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came on him. He was teaching and said, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? They were challenging Jesus' authority. He was protesting in the temple. We'll see some of these other examples of what was going on in some of these temples. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. See here? So, there were crowds in the temple, the religious and political places. And this was why they crucified Jesus. So, I think we pretty much covered that pretty thoroughly. You see, there was a power struggle here. And, look, if everyone followed Jesus' example that we just covered... Who could oppose who could oppose that? Right? I mean, the same thing happened to Jesus. Despite the crowds, in the end, there was not enough who believed to stop him from being crucified, were there? There simply weren't enough. But God already knew this, and that's why he sent him. Because if there were enough who believed in Jesus and his message, he would have never been crucified, right? This is why the gate is narrow. You see, the prison is in our own minds. It's the fear of men instead of the fear of God that allows evil to happen. It allows tyranny to happen. We're afraid of what men will do to us. We're afraid of money, losing our job. We hold on to these bodies so tightly and then the devil uses that to manipulate us because we think we can keep our life and keep our money. Just remember, every disciple was a martyr. Never forget that. Now, they didn't go out, you know, sword swinging. They were actually killed for their beliefs. They died fearing God, not men. They died knowing that this life is nothing compared to the next life and that their faithfulness in obeying God rather than men would be rewarded. Now, never ever on this channel have we promoted any kind of 
physical action against anybody because we follow Jesus' example. We fear God, not men. But also, when you're, when you're walking into something that the establishment is trying to force you to do, understand where you should be, is all I can say. And you guys all know. Let's go into the chat here. Yes, you can't keep sinning. Ask for forgiveness. Thanks, Laura. They were um, M-U-R-D-E-R-E-D, -E -E yes. Now, do you see how this, when you look at the Bible, when you truly look at it without the scales on your eyes, that it's a lot different than what we were taught in church, isn't it? But yet, everything I showed you is biblically based. It's because the church has been compromised. They're too busy trying to hold on to their money instead of teaching the truth. They're trying to have it both ways. Have you be submitted to government and do things that may be not within your best interest, but also serve God. And you can't serve two masters. You just can't. All right, you guys. I love each and every one of you. Hopefully this was helpful. Do your own research. You know, you can go into this Bible gateway and type in any word you want. Okay? And this will give you a clear picture of what the Bible is really telling you. You have to see the whole Bible together as one. If you keep, if, if you know, churches are really good at compartmentalizing and breaking things into segments and not giving you the full picture. And what you really need to do is do the whole thing. Now, here's one really cool study. I think I emailed somebody about this. They were asking about trees and fruit and all this. And I said, here's what you do. Go into Bible Gateway and do a search on the word tree. And then the truth will emerge about that we are trees. All of the verses, read them from start of the Bible to the end. It's only 287 passages. And this is how I like to do my research because the Bible has continuity. And once you see everything from start to finish, it forms a story. And this definitely forms a story. Reading about all of the trees of the Bible, then you begin to understand from the very first tree, the tree of life, to the last tree and trees in between. Then we begin to understand what this is really all about. All right, you guys. You guys have any questions for me before we get off here? All right. So many verses about trees. I hope you guys all do that study. Take some notes while you're at it. And you'll see the continuity between the verses. You'll see how they all connect to one another. Crowns. Then you could do crowns after that. Because crowns are on top of trees, right? That will blow you away. Alright, you guys. I love you. Have a great day. Take care and be safe.